7 News Sunrise, now on the radio. Tune into KLCL and KJEF on your AM dial. Weekday mornings beginning at 5 a.m. Happy 50th anniversary from all of us at Pat. From KPLC TV, this is 7 News Live at 5. Hello everyone and welcome to Live at 5. I'm Cynthia Arsenault. We start off this afternoon with a hot topic. What rights do gay and lesbian couples have when it comes to marriage and civil unions? The debate over same-sex marriage has been at the forefront of legislative debates across the country and has made its way to Louisiana. Today, a Senate committee voted 5-2 to two on a constitutional amendment that would ban same-sex marriage and civil unions in the Bayou State. The proposal now goes to the full Senate. This is the second attempt in the legislature to ban gay marriage. In 1997, a measure by then State Senator Phil Short died on the Senate floor. Now, in order for the bill to become part of the state constitution, it will require a two-thirds vote of the legislature. If that happens, the measure will then go straight to the people for a vote. The governor's signature isn't required on such measures. If it came down to the wire, how would you vote? Do you agree with the legislation that would ban same-sex marriage and civil unions? We made this the topic of today's news views, and here's what folks in southwest Louisiana had to say. The religious aspect of it, you know, it should be between a man and a woman. But reality in today's society, um, living in our country, I think gay people should have the same rights as man and, a married couple, man and woman. I think the government should have um, say so in what goes on, but they shouldn't uh, base the laws on religion. In the state of Louisiana, it's predominantly Catholic, and therefore this would be very difficult to see happen. If it goes into where it makes it legal to adopt children, then that, that kind of becomes a, a, a separate issue and, and uh, an issue that it... Uh, you know, a child, they don't have the rights and you have to speak for them. Now, if you weren't caught by our cameras, but you want to voice your opinion on same-sex marriage, just log on to kplctv.com and participate in our web poll. We'll have the results tonight on 7 News Nightcast. Prescription Medicine Authority has become a hot-button issue of the legislative session with a bill close to becoming law that would let psychologists and physician's assistants prescribe drugs. While some medical professionals praise the bill, there are others who strongly oppose the issue. Dr. David Buttress, Medical Director of Mental Health Services at Christus St. Patrick Hospital, is here to talk about the bill and what it means for patients. Dr. Buttress, thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. House Bill 1426 is the psychology prescribing bill. It uh, doesn't have anything to do with the nurse practitioners. This bill uh, authorizes psychologists who have never gone to medical school and thus are not physicians. They're not medical doctors, yet they would be authorized to prescribe psychiatric medications. These are very potent medications. They include medications like Ritalin, Xanax, Valium, Adderall. They affect not only the mind but the rest of the body. It would be a very sad thing for uh, someone who is not a physician to be given the rights to prescribe these potent medications. Louisiana would be the only state in the nation to have psychologists prescribing uh, psychotropic medications if they did get this right. Now, Dr. Buttress, you are a psychiatrist. For those in our audience who may not understand, why is there a difference between a psychiatrist being able to prescribe these medications and a psychologist? And there's a, a very, very big difference, um, but that's a good question because a lot of people don't know the answer to that. A psychiatrist is a medical doctor. They have gone to medical school. They have gone to residency. They've delivered babies, done surgery, everything that family practitioners um, have done. Whereas a psychologist has not uh, gone to medical school, they have just studied uh, therapy, books, counseling. 
Well, Doctor, do you see this as in any way putting uh, people with mental illness at a risk? It's, it's a, it would put everybody with mental illness, everybody that was prescribed a psychiatric medication at a huge risk. Um, it would, it would um, authorize someone that is not properly trained to dispense, dispense medications that affect the heart, the lungs, the kidneys. Um, this, is, this would be prescribed not only to our children but to our elderly and could inflict severe harm and damage um, to, to the citizens of Louisiana. Doctor, there is a number, a, a toll-free number that, that people can call if they're concerned about this? That's correct. The, uh, you can call the governor's office at, uh, it's a 1-800 number, 1-800-317-5918. The um, governor has until about 24 hours to make up her mind to veto this bill. So it is very, very important that you call, that all the citizens that are listening call this number and express their wish to have House Bill 1426 authorizing psychologists to prescribe medications to be vetoed. All right, Dr. Buttress, thank you so much for joining us live in the 7 News Room. Thank you. Well, more cuts may be headed to Moss Regional Hospital. Today, the state hospital system told a House Appropriations Committee it will have to cut up to $91 million in services to keep a balanced budget for the 2004-2005 fiscal year. Now, that will affect all 10 hospitals across the state. Here at home, Moss Regional is looking at $5 million in cuts that would affect the surgery unit, the intensive care unit, and the outpatient gynecology program. Today's presentations were the first step in the legislature's evaluation of the appropriation bill. No action will be taken on passing a budget bill into the full house until after May 15th. Lafayette could soon see hundreds, maybe even thousands of offshore workers from around the world flocking to the area for offshore safety and survival training. Governor Kathleen Blanco made the announcement at the Offshore Technology Conference in Houston. Scottish company RGIT Montrose has chosen Lafayette to be their regional headquarters for all offshore training operations in the U.S. Now they partner with the University of Louisiana Lafayette's Marine Survival Center and Louisiana Offshore Companies to offer courses that are certified for international industry standards. Their training uh, is now offered in the United States for the first time. They originated out of uh, training in the North Sea, which is, as we know from our oil industry uh, experiences, that's one of the most treacherous places to, to, uh, to work in. So uh, their, their training was critical to uh, making sure that people are as safe as could possibly be there. But they've expanded. Governor Blanco says this kind of offshore training supports the oil and gas industry tremendously. Four cur courses are now being offered in Lafayette, but more than 100 are expected by the summer. Well, if your kids have an imagination of their own, there's a camp this summer right up their alley. Today, kids at Dalby Elementary got a sneak peek at what Camp Invention is all about. Camp Invention happens this summer, hosted here in the Lake Area by Dalby Elementary School. It's a one-week day camp for first through fifth graders that helps kids do just what the name implies, become inventors. They think outside of the box. They do inquiry-based based learning. And uh, we really encourage them to let their imaginations go wild. They get to take apart appliances and create new inventions. They get to go to Planet Zach. They do immersion exercises. And the whole program is in alignment with national and state standards, yet it's all fun, hands-on based learning. And today was just a preview. Anyone can attend camp this summer. Camp Invention runs July 12th through the 16th at Dalby Elementary. To reserve your spot, call 1-800-968-4332. Coming up next on Live at 5, the Pentagon announces plans to keep more U.S. troops in Iraq. Plus, the Mideast peace process gets a boost. And you don't have to have a lump to have breast cancer. There are other symptoms you need to know about. Find out more in tonight's Smart Woman. Coverage. Community. Commitment. You're watching 7 News Live at 5 with Cynthia Arsenault and Chief Meteorologist Curtis Atkinson's Pinpoint Forecast. KPLC 7 News is at your service. Chug it in there, baby. Chug it. Here we go, blue. Chug it. Chug it in there. <laughs> bring it in. Bring it in. Rally here. Rally here. Come on. Throw the cheese, baby. Come on, bring it in there. Chug it. Chug it. Here we go. Here we go. Hey, batter. Swing, batter. What is that? Here we go. 
Nice job, baby. Nice job. Here we go. Nice job. Let's go. I need more from you. Life in the Dugout with Ryan Peterson, Monday at 6, only on KPLC 7 News. Here we go, baby. I'm okay. Secretary of State Colin Powell was at the United Nations today in New York to meet with senior officials from the European Union and Russia and UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. The mediators are trying to revive the roadmap for peace between Israelis and Palestinians. Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon suffered a major setback earlier this week when his U.S. backed plan to withdraw from Gaza was voted down by his party members. Michelle Franzen has the story. In an effort to get what many call a derailed Middle East peace process back on track, United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan hosted a meeting with U.S. Secretary Colin Powell and representatives from the European Union and Russia. Annan said the violence between Israelis and Palestinians must end. The quartet calls for renewed efforts to reach a comprehensive ceasefire. The meeting comes just days after Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon's unilateral proposal to pull out of Gaza was rejected by his own party. Last month, the president backed Sharon's plan that called for limited withdrawal and would allow Israel to maintain land in the West Bank. Arab leaders accused the U.S. of favoring Israel and killing the U.N.'s peace plan. The peace plan most favored by the international community would require Israel to pull out troops and settlers from a much larger area and also create a Palestinian state. Secretary of State Colin Powell said despite backing Sharon's initial plan, the U.S. still supports the U.N. peace plan. The president has not abandoned them, has not abandoned the uh, hope for uh, the creation of a Palestinian state. Is Powell not and the rest of the panel agreed to keep monitoring the peace process and also wait for Sharon to modify his plan. In New York, Michelle Franzen, NBC News. The United Nations roadmap calls for the creation of a Palestinian state by 2005 and for Israel to withdraw from land it captured in the 1967 Middle East War. Continuing violence and an unstable environment has U.S. troops staying in Iraq longer than expected. U.S. commanders plan to reduce the number of U.S. troops in Iraq, but are now conceding that they won't be able to do so. Pentagon officials say there will continue to be about 135,000 U.S. troops in Iraq until the end of next year. 10,000 active duty Army soldiers and Marines are getting orders to ship out to Iraq in the next few months. Major delays at airports in three states today. An FAA software computer problem forced departures and arrivals in South Texas, parts of Louisiana, and New Mexico to stop completely. The delay lasted about one hour. Planes were lined up on the runway at Bush Intercontinental Airport in Houston, waiting to be cleared for takeoff. The FAA is investigating the computer glitch. Wow. Um, we love computers. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad I wasn't sitting we at uh, Bush International. Well, one thing I love was the weather today. Well, I'm telling you what, it was nice, very nice today, and uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed. I think tomorrow is going to be just as good. We'll talk about it coming up in just a few minutes. 80 degrees, our current temperature, very sunny conditions, variable winds at 3, and our lake outside is still as a cucumber, so just get out there and check that out with that sunset in about 6 minutes till 8. Live Super Doppler is quiet. Your forecast is coming up next. KPLC joins Expressions, and with me today is the owner of Expressions, Susie Book. Susie, tell us about the red layer. We have some new red layers in. We have some hand-etched glass lamps in different colors. They start at $29.95, which includes two fragrances. There are 35 different fragrances to choose from, and they're much safer than burning candles because there is no open flame. And that's just one of the many items you can find here at 3204 Ryan Street. Have you been to Expressions lately? Now, from the 7 Storm Team, meteorologist Curtis Atkinson's Pinpoint Forecast. Well, we've had another nice day here in southwest Louisiana with nice sunny conditions and only a couple of clouds popping up right along the coast. Other than that, notice the clear skies for everyone. If you look really close, you can see a couple of little clouds kind of popping up. That's our sea breeze. You can see it kind of moving in, but no uh, moisture to give up any rainfall outside this evening. But that'll be things to come later on this summer. As far as across the southeast, clear skies. Look back up to the north a little bit. We do have a few clouds uh, up around the Missouri area, southern Illinois getting a little bit of rainfall. But you notice back off into Texas, more clear skies 
and that will be our forecast overnight tonight and tomorrow. So look, tomorrow looking to be another nice day as well. As far as our temperatures, we're currently seeing it around 80 degrees, 77 there in Jackson, 76 New Orleans, 83 degrees up in Shreveport and in Dallas, Fort Worth. So very warm temperatures, 86 in Amarillo. And all these uh, very warm temperatures are going to start to slide in here. And by the end of the week, we could be seeing our highs topping out around 85 or 86 degrees as well. So uh, they want to grab that sunscreen by the end of the week. As far as tonight, we're going to cool it back off into the upper 50s, about 58, 59 degrees with light south winds. Could see a little patchy fog around, but other than that, it's going to be another nice night and tomorrow another nice day, mostly sunny conditions. South winds is around 5 to 10. Should be back up into the mid to upper 70s already by the noontime hour tomorrow. Now across the nation, I wanted to uh, show you this. Uh, we have this one little disturbance, but other than that, check out all the clear skies. Uh, mountain region back off to the west, California, all the way back up to the big sky country, Montana, and all the way down to the Gulf. We're looking at most of us seeing clear skies, only this one little front passing through here. So about 90% uh, of us across the United States have got nice fair weather at this uh, late spring time. Now as far as our future cast, high pressure systems in control. That's going to keep these winds calm tonight. Therefore, we may see that fog. Otherwise, clear conditions. And then as we head into tomorrow, may get a little bit of a south wind. Otherwise, it's going to be very, very nice outside. And that will continue over the next couple of days. And as we head toward tomorrow night, when you guessed it, more clear skies. Highest tomorrow should run at about 82. Stay with us. We'll take a look all the way to the weekend after the break. The Seven Storm Team Weather Watcher Network is sponsored by Roundtree Dodge. The Southwest Louisiana Center for Health Services will host its second annual gala and roast honoring Louisiana State Senator Willie Mount. Join us Saturday, May 29th at the Lake Charles Civic Center's Exhibition Hall and help us celebrate the center's 25th anniversary. Roasters will include State Representative Elsie Guillory and Louisiana Governor Kathleen Blanco. Proceeds will be used to provide quality health care for the uninsured through the Southwest Louisiana Center for Health Services. For tickets, call 493-5122. Tonight's forecast, mostly clear, may have a little patchy morning fog. Other than that, a very nice evening, light south winds. Lows should fall to around 58, mid-50s back up toward the north. And if you're headed out on our waters, which is uh, looking nice this afternoon, south winds at around 10 knots, 2 to 3 foot seas, water temperatures are in the mid-70s. Tomorrow's forecast, mostly sunny, high around 82, so it's going to be a little warm. And as we head through the next several days, we continue to stay dry. And we'll call for about 84 degrees by Friday. And next week, uh, going around 85, and some of the models point to 86 or 87 by early next week. So uh, starting to get into this uh, warm, humid uh, weather. Just the muggies. I know, I tell you, after having these couple of cool mornings earlier in the week, I really hate to see this humidity coming back. It's got to come to an end. Yes, it does. The good thing always comes to an end. Well, it's a topic that's up there with religion and politics. Spanking. Everybody has an opinion and a new study is sure to reignite the debate. The research suggests spanking before age two may be a risk factor for aggressive behavior in some children. Medical reporter Helen Chickering has details. No! The impact of spanking has been the topic of a number of studies, most with mixed results. The latest research is one of the first to look at spanking in youngsters under two. Before age two, uh, children are undergoing rapid developmental change and rapid brain development. And we thought that during this period, spanking could be riskier than spanking older children. Dr. Eric Slade studied spanking in nearly 2,000 toddlers. The children who were spanked at least once in the previous week were approximately twice as likely as children who were not spanked uh, to have behavior problems four years later that required their parent to come to school and discuss those problems with a teacher. The children who were spanked early in life are also more likely to be described by their parents as having behavior problems and being sad or depressed when they hit school age. Findings researchers note that only applied to white children, not African Americans or Hispanics. There's speculation that in African American and Hispanic families that uh, where spanking may be considered more culturally normative, that uh, spanking is less likely to have a detrimental effect for children. White parents that spank frequently were also more likely to have a lower education level, lower income, and a higher rate of depression. 
Dr. Slade stresses the findings don't mean that spanking is okay for some parents and risky for others. He says it's important for parents to examine why they spank. The take home message for parents is that they should feel comfortable in the disciplinary practices and punishments that they've been using in their families and that they're comfortable with. But at the same time, uh, they want to be aware of the frequency with which they're spanking their children, particularly young children. And if spanking becomes part of a routine that keeps up as kids get older, Dr. Slade says it may be a red flag that there could be more serious issues involved and it's time to get help. Helen Chickering, NBC News. Dr. Slade stresses that the study doesn't mean spanking is right for some and wrong for others. He says the impact of spanking on a child's development depends on circumstances in which it's used. It's one of the most aggressive forms of breast cancer, yet most people have never even heard of it. Although inflammatory breast cancer accounts for only 1 to 5 percent of all breast cancers, less than half of diagnosed patients survive. Marty Salt has details on the disease and introduces us to one smart woman determined to beat the odds. KPLC 7 News Smart Woman, brought to you by U.S. agencies. When Janice Freed was told she had inflammatory breast cancer, she'd never heard of the disease. She wasn't alone. As I went through the process of finding doctors, talking to nurses and talking to people, I found more and more and more, even people in the medical profession have never heard of inflammatory breast cancer. And that frightened me a great deal. Janice's doctor, Helen Kuroki, says recognizing the symptoms is the first line of defense. Most traditional forms of breast cancer present with a lump. That is not always the case for inflammatory breast cancer. Symptoms include a rapid increase in breast size, itchy nipple, a bruise that doesn't go away, feverish breast or breast pain. IBC is often misdiagnosed as a breast infection. If she finds that she's been treated for an infection in the breast and it has not cleared in one to two weeks, it's absolutely essential that re she return to her physician for follow-up care, which would most likely include a biopsy. My second batch of chemotherapy. Anyone can get IBC, but women in their 50s are at greater risk. We also note that African-American women have about a two times higher risk of having inflammatory breast cancer than other ethnic groups. Treatments continue to improve, but the prognosis is still poor. The statistics for inflammatory breast cancer are not good, but the only two that matter are zero and 100 percent, and I intend to be that 100 percent. I intend to be here for as long as I possibly can. This is Marty Salt reporting. Treatment differs from other types of breast cancer. Chemotherapy is usually prescribed before a mastectomy and then followed with radiation. When it comes to TV moms, who tops the chart? We'll tell you who the number one TV mom of all time is up next. Is your office looking like a ghost town? Log on to kplctv.com and see how KPLC's job link can work for you. Post a job, find a job. KPLC Job Link. Local jobs from local companies. Only on kplctv.com. Brought to you by Harris, West Cal Cam Hospital, and Delta Downs. The news you watch all the time is available online anytime. KPLCTV.com gives you instant access to the latest news, weather, sports, and much more. Ask the expert on KPLCTV.com. You email us the question. The expert emails you the answer. I'm J.J. Gibson with Prescription Specialties. For your questions about specialized medications like natural hormone replacement, go to KPLCTV.com to ask the expert. 
The Cosby Show's Claire Huxtable gets top billing as TV's best mom. A new poll of TV viewers ranks the Cosby family matriarch as television's best mother of all time. Mrs. Huxtable, played by Felicia Rashad, was a tough but witty mother of five who juggled parenting with her career as an attorney. And guess who came in second? It was Marion Ross, the actress who played Mrs. Cunningham, on Happy Day. Uh, yeah, you know, we were talking about it, and there was a lot of yeah. good moms a back A lot of good moms days, yeah. on TV. That's going to do it for Live at 5. We'll see you back at 6.